Here we are again. This is a bit of a side quest for the Jay and Rob Toy Show, but I couldn't pass up this opportunity. In the waiting room, our little green room studio, we have a good friend, and that's Mr. James Etock. And I just want to take a few minutes and talk with him so you know a little bit more about who he is and we can share about some of the awesome things that he's done. So let me bring James into the chat. James, thanks for joining us. Hello. This is the green room you spoke about. It's vaguely yes, like my our room. Virtual, well. <laughs> our virtual green you know, waiting room for all our high-profile guests. Hopefully the accommodations were okay. The M&Ms were delivered. Yep, separately colored in different bowls. That was very good. I, I, I like that. That was good. Very much appreciated. Well, we, we aim to please. That was on your writer before you appeared. You said, I really need all my candy organized alphabetically and by, by color, starting with brightest to darkest. So absolutely try. <laughs> you did well. Uh, so thanks again. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for taking the time uh, to chat. Uh, I've known you for four or five years. I think the first time I met you was at PowerCon, and I think it was 2016, uh, when it was still in Torrance, California, so, yeah. when, we were, you know, when we were filming for Power of Grayskull. Uh, this is something that we had been in touch with you months leading up to it, and we were able to pull you aside for, I think, an hour or so in a, uh, in a panel room and, and chat with you. Uh, before that... I knew you as this guy on He-Man.org's forums known as Serial Geek and James Busted Tunes. You're all over the place. I'm like, oh, this guy knows like everything about He-Man. What, what, is, what is your background for, for everybody that might not know of your work and, and who you are and, and where you come from? Oh, man. So um, well, I'm from merry old uh, England, the UK, London specifically. And uh, yeah, my background, I guess, is just a fan that grew up loving 1980s animation. And then somehow that became a career. You know, it went from, oh, I really like this, these cartoons. And then the internet came along and I thought, well, let me talk about these cartoons. And then the people that worked on those shows said, hey, let me tell you about the cartoons that you're talking about. And then I just accumulated all this knowledge, specifically about He-Man and She-Ra, but there were a few other shows as well, like Real Ghostbusters. And uh yeah, that led to, over the years, me working on brands like He-Man and She-Ra and Ghostbusters and a few others, I think. I'm trying to think. It's one of the, oh, Dungeons and Dragons. That was my one of my favorite animated shows. I'm looking on my shelf for my DVDs and going, what else have I worked on? Defenders of the Earth, Flash. No big deal. Those are, those are pretty low-profile uh, industry names that you're throwing out there. Uh, you, you'll be sure to take some medicine for for your back for all that heavy lifting you're doing with those name drops. <laughs> I, uh, but I never did get to work on Bionic 6 because we ne they never did Aww. a DVD release of that. And I love how are, Bionic 6. How are you going to sleep at night having only worked on Ghostbusters and Masters of the Universe? <laughs> I mean, James, I feel oh, so my bad Bionic for you. Six. We're going to have to start a petition to get Bionic 6 happening because we won't be able to get through the day otherwise. I can't. I, I still. It's, it's literally like the. They even released Mighty Orbots and Galaxy High. It's like there's one Tokyo Movie Shincha show to go. Tokyo Movie Shincha show, and it's uh, yeah, Bionic Six. It never got a re. Uh, never got a release, and it's so frustrating. But one day, one day, it'll happen. Maybe one someone day. will see this and be like, "Why haven't we released that?" So yeah. that's such a good idea. What a great idea! <laughs> oh no, actually, what a great idea. Well, I, I just remembered who owned it. It's my friends over at NBC Universal. <laughs> Oh, okay. Well, I've I've got something about them on, on my notes, but I want I want to ask you, well, kind of about the internet. The internet was kind of like your playground. You're one of the early adopters of of fan fiction and uh, and fan knowledge and trivia, and really connecting when it was such a forum based wild west of, oh, I can talk to this person in Germany or these people in America, and we all like the same stuff. And that's kind of when you you really started kicking your spurs around, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I first got on the internet in late 95. Um, and back then there was one He-Man website. Well, I mean, I trawled the internet. I was like, anybody still remember this He-Man cartoon? Because in like November 95, you're not even sure if anybody around the world is still, how it has the figures or the cartoons on VHS. And um, yeah, stumbled upon a website where one guy was just talking about his figures. And I thought, oh, someone actually remembers. And then about a month later, what would become heman.org i think i think that was when it launched on a university uh, ftp this is like you know how the internet was it wasn't people with their computers at home it was the university campus ftps and uh, this guy adam tyner had this heman website and i started contributing episode reviews 
and late 95 and at the same time reading a few other people's views and thinking oh, i really want to i really would like to see all these episodes that i haven't seen since i was a kid and yeah like i say you know within i think it was within a year i was talking to larry dottilio who was one of the prime the late great larry dottilio now who was one of the prime writers on many an 80 80s cartoon but he man and specifically she-ra was uh, where larry kind of hit the dizzying heights and um yeah to talk to him one-on-one -on -one just by our email was phenomenal at that point i had to say to larry how many episodes of he-man are there and he's like oh 130 because we didn't even know that there was no wikipedia there was no information to have so i was like okay um and then slowly but surely you you know you learn very quickly you can't ask him what did you think of the episode the problem with power because larry's like it's been well i mean at that point it was probably like it's been 13 years since I worked on the show or something, which it seems crazy now that it's uh, even longer. But um, yeah, I was, I was at the forefront of that, I guess, nos well, it was before the nostalgia boom happened because around about 2000 was when Wizard Magazine and stuff started looking at these websites like heman.org and um, Spook Central, which is a real Ghostbusters one. All these, uh, B uh, Big Bot was the original Transformers website. And uh, yeah, just started going, hey, let's start celebrating this nostalgia. And then we had kind of the toy reel releases and then the, the, the cartoon reboots and, you know, where we are today, really, where shows from the 90s and noughties are being rebooted. So, yeah, it's um, it's been a it's been a unique journey. That must have been an awesome sense of discovery every time you were able to get a oh. new piece of information from somewhere in the world or connect with somebody that worked on the show in, in whatever capacity, like you're building this master list, filling in all the gaps that you know are there. And then it's the picture is becoming slowly clearer. It's, I've with said, every but I've, I've, even to this day though, even to this day, you still, it's amazing to discover new stuff about like for me, the filmation cartoon or, or the Mattel toy line itself. We, we still get the odd bit of information to go, oh my goodness, I think last week I, f I forget there was something. And I was like, oh, that makes sense. You know, we've, we've finally discovered that. Um, I think about two years ago or two or three years ago, we discovered that He-Man's second season was only supposed to be 39 episodes. It's like, oh, <laughs> discovered that, you know, so many years later. It was, it was just, you know, you need little bits and pieces you find. And then, you know, my, my career, as it were, would lead to me at one point being in Los Angeles, well, numerous times in Los Angeles, but being in Los Angeles and being in Lou Scheimer's house, who was the president of Filmation, who made He-Man the cartoon happen. And I'm there in this, probably the most expensive house I've ever been in, but with probably the most down-to-earth, normal human being ever in Lou Scheimer. It's just like, wow, I'm actually sitting... And I've said before, like it was one of those situations where uh, later you look back and you go, Oh my God, why didn't I get a photo with him at his house or when we had lunch together? And it's because he he never made himself, I'm Luke Scheimer. He was, you know, on the same level. He would ask you about you. And I, but it wasn't until later, I was like, he was asking me questions about what I was working on and, you know, certain A Man and Filmation questions. And I'm thinking, but he was Luke Scheimer. <laughs> it's really weird. But um, yeah, fan fantastic. Uh, like, like I say, the, the, the career I've had celebrating 80s cartoons has afforded me like all these unique and kind of rare experiences um and yeah that led to like stuff like me doing serial geek magazine and yeah talk about serial geek where, where did that idea come from for everybody that doesn't know oh my goodness because so, when i when i first discovered heman.org it was probably 2008 2008 2009 it was great right, it was before classics came out so it would have been mid 2008 or so when i first moved to the u.s Absolutely. And at that point, I was seeing images of Serial Geek, and I bought like six from you, I guess. Uh, I had emailed and paypal you money, and they arrived on my doorstep in Texas. I had to have some some copies for myself. So where did that come from? How did that start? Well, the, the originally, the, the you know, I'd always wanted to do just a, sounds crazy, like just a HEMAP magazine. I thought, well, all, the, all this information, these illustrations, cell scans, behind-the-scenes artwork, wouldn't it be great just to do a HEMAP magazine? And I thought, legally, I can't do that. So I thought, well... I've got a love of all these 80s cartoons. Why don't I hire writers and artists and say, write about this, illustrate that? Uh, so I was like the Met editor and put together this magazine talking, and every issue was themed. So the first issue was about violence. So you, had to, you talked about violence in Transformers the movie where everybody got destroyed. <laughs> uh, violence in the She-Ra cartoon and the He-Man cartoon, which as we know was very much like, I'm going to beat the hell out of this robot. You know, you had to punch robots all the time. Real Ghostbusters, violence in the you know in a very unique way, but still talked about death. 
Um, yeah, so uh, Serial Geek was all about highlighting themes per issue about 80s cartoons, but it, it was spawned out of the idea of me and my ex, ex obviously at the time not ex-girlfriend, we were um, just talking about magazines and stuff, and I just kind of quit my day job. And we were talking, I said, I'd love to do a magazine about 80s cartoons. I talked about the He-Man stuff and then the legalities of it, and then just thought, oh, I'll do an 80s, just celebrate all these 80s cartoons. And she was, um, she worked in fashion. She, she was by these glossy, ridiculously thick magazines all about fashion. And, but they were like, they had really unique presentation style and layout. So I was kind of inspired by that. So the first issue of Serial Geek was incredibly dark because it reflected everything in these pop magazines, uh, pop magazines, fashion magazines. One was called Pop. And it was, uh, yes, yeah, so all the imagery was quite dark in the first issue. And by about issue two, three, it kind of found its feet. And it's like, okay, let's do what I should be doing, which is bright, vibrant colours. So Serial Geek became this, um, yeah, like I say, celebration of 80s cartoons. And, uh, yeah, pe people really seem to gravitate to it it was just one of those things that has been you know i've still got two more issues to to do and it's just been one of the most expensive ventures ever really because it was um everything you know from the artist to the writers to the publishing to the shipping was all coming out of my pocket um and yeah i i, I took it to the san diego comic-con in 2014 with hopes of oh it's going to be and everybody was like it's going to be a hit it's going to be a smash hit and then it wasn't because the San Diego Comic Con was very different from the one I'd been to in 2006. In 2014, nobody was there to really buy stuff. They were there just to show off their cosplay costumes and to meet the uh, Marvel people, which I understand. I wanted to meet the Marvel people. I was stuck at my table trying to shill my magazine, but uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a depressing story for another time. <laughs> Two observations there. First is, anytime people are trying to uh, rekindle their love for stuff from the 80s or, or even 90s. It seems to be an, an expensive de uh, endeavor. You're putting together a magazine and the cost of art and, and publishing and shipping is very similar to an action figure collector who's trying to get those pieces of, of their childhood and put them on the shelf. It's, oh, the shipping cost is ridiculous. Oh, this figure is 50 bucks. Going after the things and developing our passion for, our, for what kind of our building blocks of our youth is super expensive. More interestingly, though, it's interesting that in the 90s, you were rekindling your love for He-Man and putting those pieces of the puzzle together. And then you start working on this magazine, this this what a proper editorial opinion piece of called Serial Geek, and how both of those things really come together for the next big thing that I know that you were a part of, and that's that Dark Horse book, the episode guide for all uh, He-Man and Sheer, the filmation stuff. It, it's like you couldn't have done that dark horse guide without those two other pieces in, in your portfolio, I don't think. If you hadn't yeah, done mean, all that legwork, if you hadn't yeah. done what it's like to put a book together, I don't think it would have came together. And I, and I know you released the episode guy a little bit before the dark horse actual release, but I don't think you could have done that ha had you not gone through the trials and tribulations of those. No, I, th I think every project, w w the next project, every project that comes along is always almost built upon the foundation of everything that came before it. That sounds like a bit of a cliche but it's true it's um you know the internet the the whole fanboy you know celebrating he-man and she-ra starts off as a, a website me and this guy in america zadok angel we create the episode review website which you know he-man and she-ra fans come to en masse and then we end that website but as we end it mattel say hey we're doing a cartoon in 2002 do you want to write a an encyclopedic guide so our writers have something to refer to that's based on filmation okay that happens then you get the um based on that it's right now the dvds are happening um you know the dvd releases so based on the website and the fact i've done some official work then comes the dvd work and then from that comes uh working on the ghostbusters dvd which kind of leads to the ghostbusters comic that's like a little tangent um, and then, yeah, Serial Geek comes from that. The unofficial guide comes from that. The official Dark Horse Animated Adventures guide comes from that. And everything, and even the um, during that time as well, I'm hired to work on the He-Man and She-Ra, or the He-Man and separately She-Ra um, official YouTube channels, where it's like, oh, wow, I can, I've got carte blanche to do whatever I want, or so I thought. But, yeah, it's, it's one of those things where... Yeah, everything and like every every next project, it's a culmination of everything that's come before it. 
that's yeah. So I, I wholeheartedly it, it's agree. A, it, when you look back with hindsight, like it's so clearly obvious how things fit together, and yet mm. I know creatively when you go forward, it, it's hard to realize you're relying on all the, all that experience. But it's it's true. You're a hundred percent right, and it's probably a cliche for a reason. It all just fits together so well. And I guess this this kind of brings me to that weird topic that I that I see all the time. People are asking you about on Facebook. We're Facebook friends, of course. Um, I cornered you into that after we interviewed you for Power of Grace. Well, you had to be our friend. Uh, I, I've interviewed you for Action Figure Adventure as well because I said, "Hey, remember how much fun we had for Power of Grace? Go, let's do it again." Uh, everybody, it seems, once a week on your social media, specifically Facebook, I notice, is like, what, what's going on with your cartoon? This cartoon called Return of Faker. Because I'm in the He-Man community, and I'm sorry to bring it up, I have to bring it up. Because I'm in the He-Man community, I know this is a project that you've been on for a few years now, I think. And everybody seems to be obsessed with it. What is Return of Faker and what is going on with it? Well, the short and skinny version, which <clears throat> just that suits me at the moment, um, is that The Return of Faker was a filmation, I guess, homage, or a love letter to the filmation cartoon that myself and Dusan Mitrovic kind of came up with. Let's, let's, let's bring the toy accurate Faker to the filmation cartoon because the He-Man episode was originally just He-Man with glowing eyes. So it's like, let's have the proper toy accurate Faker. And we worked on this you mean project. just like a drawing or something, or, or th like this is an animated thing? Animated yeah. from start to finish, 30 minutes, maybe 31 minutes at a push. It's got a moral segment, um, everything. It's got bumpers. <laughs> it's, got, it's got everything you want in a He-Man cartoon. Okay, the, stop but, right there. I need to clarify this, because I thought originally Return of Faker was not a full 30-minute episode or 23 minutes, but now you're saying 31 minutes. I thought it was literally, if, let's see what Faker would have looked like if he was in the cartoon as the figure looks. So the figure is blue, Skeletor's armor. Originally, Filmation's Faker was just He-Man with glowing eyes, like you said. And they've released that figure too, which is nice. But you're putting blue Faker into an actual cartoon. Now, is this swapping out another character? Or is this writing your own thing? It, like, And so, are you guys like drawing this? Like how you... what? I'm trying yeah, so to understand, the, the, James, what is going on here? So the way we put it together was um, the, the quickest way to describe it I can is the, come up with the idea to put, include Faker in the Filmation cartoon. So basically you everything in the Filmation in the Return of Faker is traced from actual original Filmation footage. And to create Faker, you take the animation of He-Man and you overlay Skeletor's armor onto him, and then you trace that. Um, it's a long, arduous process, but um, yeah, Faker, it was about bringing him into the Filmation universe and um, and telling a pretty good story along the way. But the way to tell the story was you're limited with the dialogue because all the dialogue comes from the Filmation cartoon. You know, um, uh, two of the, uh, well, Linda Gary, who played Teela the Sorceress, Queen Marlene, all these characters sadly passed away in 95. So we we're bringing her back with her voice, but it's all taken from different episodes. So the episode was created primarily first with the audio track. The audio, as I like to say, was the storyboard. Because in my brain, right. I went through every episode and I'm trying to figure out, right, these characters are having a conversation. So I can take that from that episode. Because when you've when you've studied He-Man and She-Ra for near on like 40, 30 something years, you know the dialogue Back, back and forward kind of thing. So I, I know how to have a conversation between characters from different episodes. So we created this audio thing. Then I did the storyboard to that so I could visualize it. Dusan did all the animation. I colored it. Andrew Kramer colored it. We had Yuka Isaac Heinen chipping the colors. We had Keith Seymour doing some of the special effects. And we put together this 30 minute cartoon that we were just gonna upload to YouTube for free. We're like, hey YouTube, here it is. A month prior so to us what, doing that something came so along. Let, me, let me stop you there because what i think is really interesting being a filmmaker is you've inadvertently had to follow in filmation's footsteps which was widely known for reusing certain sequences but having different audio tracks underneath you've gone through and taking 
taken like the looks and the storyboarding based on what dialogue was available, traced over it, and, and basically done like what filmation would do nowadays to cut costs, but put out a cartoon. So it's their same as system, I think is what it was called, because they would do an episode and be like, these boards are same as 59 to 68 or something like that. So people can know they pull from that stock system and that would be the gap. And it looks like you've done this fan film, the filmation way. Well, it's funny it's because on my computer and I assume on, on, on uh, do sounds computer as well there's a folder and it's just all these stock sequences we've created like we didn't we didn't use every single one in the return of faker but we've just got all this animation so in other words if we wanted to create another episode within reason we could the only thing that ever limits us in creating this content is the audio um, because you really want those classic voices um, the funny thing is in, in recent in the last couple of years you've seen that technology where uh, artificial intelligence, like the AI, you can input dialogue and then type out a sentence and it starts to, and you, you think, how long is it before that's available to the public? And suddenly you can bring yeah. these characters, you can have John Irwin as He-Man saying new dialogue or Linda Gary, who's no longer with us, or Alan Oppenheimer, or George DiCenzo, who's no longer with us, like Lou Scheimer, of course, like all these people um, whose voices aren't as strong as they once were. You could bring these characters and have new dialogue. And, Unfortunately, when that happens, when we're able to recreate or create new dialogue, then you start going, I really want to make more episodes. <laughs> and yeah. as it stands, we can't even we can't even do anything with this one 30 minute episodes as it is. So, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I'm not a lawyer, but there's some legal things with taking a, a performance from another person. But you've been talking about this 30, 31 minute cartoon as if it's a thing from the past, but it's not something I've seen. Uh, no. So why not? Because it's fascinating to me. How come it's not out there? What's 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 going on? What is it the, like the legality of it? Well, how come I can't watch it? Uh, because NBC Universal one month before sent a cease and desist saying, you know, this is our property. You cannot uh, show this for free anywhere. Um, although, uh, yeah, and I, I my my kind of. Uh, befuddled mind was replying to them, but you knew about this for three years. Why did you wait until a month before? You were okay. And I think what happened, and maybe someone at NBC one day will correct me uh, if I'm wrong, but I think it got too much hype. Um, I, I remember one fan saying, I think it became too big for its own boots. And I think it's true. Like the return of Faker became this quite big entity and it was going to be shown at PowerCon um, 2019. It was going to have a Saturday night airing. And then, yeah, I got the, the a, a month before we finished the project, this cease and desist landed in my inbox. And I, I pleaded with them. I said to NBC Universal, look, we're not looking to make money. Let us show it at PowerCon. Let us put it on YouTube or just let us show it at PowerCon. And then you can have it. You can do whatever you want with it. I was saying to NBC Universal, put it on a DVD, put it on a Blu-ray, put it on your YouTube channel, whatever. Just just so it's out there. That's all we wanted. It was never about money. It was never, you know, no financial gain. It was just about celebrating the Filmation cartoon. It was a love letter. I mean, at the at 20, at the 2018 PowerCon, we showed the first act of The Return of Faker. And in the first two rows, there were about seven or eight people that worked at Filmation. Like Rob Lamb, Tom Tatter and Howitz, Robbie London, Ralby Goran, um, Vic Dalchell. There was a bunch of guys there. And afterwards, they all came up to me, like surrounded me. And it was one of the most beautiful. They were just like, that was fantastic. And I'm like, oh, thank you so much. And they were just heaping praise on it. And I was like, these are the guys that worked on He-Man and She-Ra. And now they're saying, good job on bringing it back and making it as good as we could ever do. And it was just like, this is why. It was It was always a love letter to Filmation. You know, I've got such a, a love for that. I don't, I don't, don't get me wrong. I, I know Filmation... He Man had it had its flaws. Of course it did. If you, if you can't admit something has its flaws, then you clearly don't understand what you're watching. But I, I love it. That's the He Man that spoke to me the most. Um, the stories, the adventures, the action, the characters, the family, as I like to say, that you had on both heroes and villains. Mm -hmm. And with the Return of Faker, it was just almost like let's create the 131st episode of He Man and let's bring back Faker, but let's make him the blue version and go toe-to-toe -to -toe with He-Man, um, you know, have a real sense, a real fight. 
because originally it started off as a 20 minute cartoon and then it just got bigger and bigger and bigger it's like yeah i think this is going to be slightly longer so yeah ended up as like 30 31 minutes i think um so yeah but uh, but at the moment it's in limbo the return of faker sits in limbo waiting for i don't know something i i every once in a while i'll hit up nbc universe and say how's that meeting going that you had over a year ago <laughs> Actually, yeah, a year and a half ago, I guess. Whew. Well, just listening to what you're talking about, it sounds like the only thing stopping an actual release is this cease and desist from NBC Universal. Hmm. But that really gets my gears turning, man. I, I think, well, I don't want to say anything because this is going out to people and whatnot, but let's talk off the air about something really cool because I think. I think the story's not done yet. I think your your mission, your journey, your quest with this cartoon may only really just be beginning. Okay? Very intriguing, Rob. So when when we finish here, just hang on the line and we'll we'll talk, all right? I will. So uh I, I want to give you a chance to plug anything else that you're working on, James, because this is a rare opportunity that I get to that I get to pull you from from jolly old England and into <laughs> toy shed um what else are you working on where can people find you uh what what do they need to know about what's going on with james right now um i, I admittedly because of the whole uh, corona thing <laughs> uh work has been uh i guess non-existent well for me anyway obviously people are working so I, I started this year and i've set myself a bunch of projects that i'm looking into doing so there's a couple more unofficial guides i might be writing um i just thought to myself there are a few shows that i know a lot about that i could sit down and uh go to town on so i'm thinking there might be two more unofficial cartoon guides that i may pen this year i don't know if they'll come to anything i've actually pitched one to a company and said would you be interested in this um so we'll see um other than that uh i'm gonna spend most of this year because it's a big big transitional year for me i'm gonna you know i'm trying to save money so um i uh i'm selling like lots of my he man Shira animation art that i've collected over the years i've got like you know still enough still ten thousand pieces that i need to sell that i've accumulated since going to the warehouse the filmation warehouse back in 2001 it's like oh good more artwork more artwork and it's like right i need to start selling again so um, yeah, I'll start selling that. But yeah, the one the one place people can, I guess, find me more than ever these days is on. Well, I haven't been on Instagram for a month, but Instagram's my go-to place. It's um, Serial Geek, as in breakfast cereal geek. Uh, uh, seventy-seven. Yeah, Serial Geek seventy-seven is my um, uh, Instagram handle. Is that right? Yeah. Cool. Well, I mean, just the the chance for people to know that they can get some awesome uh, He Man Ishira artwork. I know about six months ago you had a, a line pencil from Secret of the Sword with the sword hovering between uh, He Man Ishira and Shira, yeah. and I was able to nab that from from your auction. Oh, did so, you get that one? Uh, yeah, I got that one. Yeah. Oh right. And I, and I got that... a couple of your Ghostbuster ones too that you had up. I got like a really oh, nice right. one of, yeah. uh, of Vankman and, and Ray and Egon in, in Ecto two as well. Nice. So. Yeah, so it's cool. So if you want to check out and have a chance to get some He Man Ashira either line art or animation cells or whatever Jay's put or J James is putting up there, Serial Geek seventy seven at Instagram, you'll be able to check it out uh, and just sh shout out at him. Tell him you want to see Return to Faker because yes, there, <laughs> there's something there's because you don't hear it enough. <laughs> but no, we're going to say like that. it's mainly I get it on um, actually I get it on Facebook messages, but Instagram seems to be the one where people say. Where's this return of faker or the, the the other cheeky thing which i understand is can you send the return of faker to me it's like i wish i could but i could send it to like 10 people or i could send it to two people and then it could leak and then people say like why don't you leak it anonymously it's like because nbc universe will know where it's come from <laughs> it's yeah, like exactly. i made it it's here i can't go oh how did that get out oh the russians it's, it's must so have cool me. though it's so cool knowing that there's a 31 minute He-Man fan film out there done in filmation style, the filmation way. Like, oh, I, as a collector who's always driven to get those things and put them on my shelf and relive my childhood, that's so tantalizing. So uh, I'm going to wrap this up now because I, I got to talk to you off air about what my idea, idea is. So uh, everybody, thanks for watching uh, this side quest of the Jay and Rob Toy Show. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time. And James, I appreciate you taking the time to, to chat about all things James Talk your career, 
Return of Faker, and uh, everything else. So bye-bye, everybody.